again, welcome to the Memoir Channel. My name is Nikki Smart and today I'm speaking with Gina Frangello about her memoir, Blow Your House Down, a story of family, feminism and treason. So this memoir, wow, oof, oof, oof. it was a Good Morning America recommended book, a BuzzFeed most anticipated book of the year, a Lit Hub most anticipated book of the year, a Rumpus most anticipated book of the year, a Bustle most anticipated book of the month, so I'm very anticipated and I can see why because I'm going to swear now. It's fucking fantastic. So please get out there, read this book. Um, it's just it's glorious. I mean, it's just full of anger and it just is rage, but a rightful rage and a really intelligent probing. Let's go talk to Gina. Hopefully she's more eloquent in expressing what I'm trying to say. All right. Hi, Gina, and welcome to the Memoir Channel. Hi, thank you for having me. Okay, so your book, I know it's Blow Your House Down, but it kind of blows my mind as well. <laughs> I'm so impressed and I just... I wish there were more women writing what you're writing. I just feel like oh, it just was so it was so empowering to read it. So thank you. Thank you absolutely. so much. Thank you. So, I um, think um I think divorce memoirs are having a moment at the uh, right now. All mine is three years old, but um, but it seems like uh there's been a little bit of a temperature change in publishing where um, some of the things that when I was writing about them, people were saying, like, we're not allowed to say this. Um, it seems like people are starting to say it. So thank God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so maybe just for people that haven't read um, Blow Your House Down, could you just give a very brief sort of overview of what it's about? So actually, I mean, when I referenced like divorce memoirs having a moment, um, I mean, I, I don't really actually see blow your house down as a divorce memoir but more of like a midlife memoir and it's 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 sort of about just the multiple pressures that are on middle-aged women from every corner often caregiving our elderly parents parenting young children making marriages work or seem to work um working ourselves trying to have careers in my case writing editing etc um and health um and then what kind of happens when all of that gets into a pressure cooker and explodes in my case i got a divorce and shortly after my divorce my father who lived in my house for 15 years 16 years died and then i got diagnosed with breast cancer so it was just sort of like a trifecta of midlife insanity and i look at it all through a cultural lens um you know at the risk of making it sound dry but i look at it through a lot not only through a personal lens of my own life but through like the cultural lens of feminist theory law medicine um a lot of different you know literature film a lot of outside sources that sort of teach us how to be a woman and yeah. um you know like the trope of the self-destructive woman perfect women all of these things laws against adultery certain forms of sex the way that chronic pain and illness are treated in the medical community for women as opposed to for men so just a lot of different um areas it's got it's got a lot of moving parts <laughs> no it's fantastic and i mean your insight into everything is remarkable um i mean and it's it's it, you you write beautifully i mean you just write so spectacularly and uh it feels so um I mean, I know people have called it rage-filled and I can see there's that anger and, but it's so brave. I feel like, cause you just friggin' dug into yourself. So I'm, I'm wondering, was it really cathartic to write? It's, it's funny. I, my running joke with many friends is that I got to be the poster girl for female rage for about 10 minutes. It was, um, yeah. <laughs> but, but I actually feel like that. I mean, I, I didn't see the memoir that way myself but it the fact that it was spun that way to a certain extent that the media allowed me to talk about really meaningful issues as opposed to kind of just the personal issues of like mm -hmm. so you had cancer so you had an affair you know like and mm -hmm. and so I actually got to talk about issues that I cared about um in terms of women's literature the way women self-present so it ended up being kind of a a, a cool and interesting springboard but um but you no know, i think 
I, 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 I know a lot of memoirists, including many who are, who have been on your channel and my own husband's been on your channel, like writing a memoir. I mean, you know, all power to those who feel that it is cathartic. Like usually it stirs up all the dirt before mm -hmm. anything settles. Like it is a disturbing act before it is in any way a, an act of closure or calming. Right. Um, and and for most of us, um, because production takes a while, I mean, the minimum it takes a book to get out into the world after it's been, you know, accepted for publication is is a year. In some cases, it's closer to two years. So you often spend most of that time rather sick to your stomach too, thinking like, what have I done? Oh my God, when I leave my house, my, my next door neighbor is going to be like, hmm, I know a bit more about you now, yes. you know? So it's, yes. it's, it's all just kind of horrifying. Well, but, I mean, uh, yeah, but, but I mean, your neighbor's going to know more about it because you are, I mean, you almost brutally reveal yourself, but it, it's so, it's fantastic. So you're very brave. It's very courageous. So Thank you. I mean, I really wanted to, and that's where the part where it does become cathartic, I think, is like, I, I feel very strongly that, um, you know, the point of memoir is not really different from the point of literary fiction, right? Um, I'm mm -hmm. a fiction writer by by trade. Um, the writing is different because you have a completely preset plot and things that happened. I can't decide I didn't get cancer. I can't decide, you know, those sorts of things. So, right. but, um, but in the sense of portraying myself as a character, I did not want to approach the book as like, see what a great person I am. And like these bad things happen to me. Like when I write literary fiction for better or worse, not everyone's like this, but the writers that I love, like Mary Gates Gill, Margaret Atwood, you know, Dr. O, like Toni Morrison, you know, Arundhati Roy, like they are interrogators of, of character. And mm -hmm. so, and are fairly ruthless with their characters. And so I have always tried to aim for that sort of thing in fiction. And mm -hmm. when I wrote memoir, I tried to do the same. I really tried to say like, well, now I am a, a character in a Gina Frangelo novel, only right. here's the plot, I've got it, but I can't be kind to her, you know? No, and I, I think that's funny because ruthless interrogation sounds about right. <laughs> and But the thing is, is that the, you know, while that is not easy to write or then easy to think is about to go out into the world the response from readers was what did kind of bring it full circle into a more cathartic thing because mm -hmm. i think many of us were we live in our isolated bubbles of shame right and we think no one would ever feel or think or do this thing that i felt or thought or you know it's a very mm -hmm. it, it has a little tinge of you know i'm the piece of shit at the center of the universe narcissism but we all suffer from it right we all have so much shame and um and in a way by just kind of like flaying that out there in a in a certain way not just like i hope not gratuitously like oh i'm opening a vein but in a way of like how does my life fit into the lives mm -hmm. of um, I received so many letters, like, I mean, just thousands of forms of outreach from social media to letters to me, to my publicists, basically from women who were like, I've done this. I felt that I, you know, you, you spoke this out loud, like women who said, you know, my mother in a in another country has been in shame for 30 years because of you know having yeah. committed adultery and and so i'm sending her your book in hope that this is going to help bring her some closure and that sort of thing made it worth it i mean it made it worth it because i i'm one person but there are you know just always hundreds and hundreds of thousands if not more of us out there right. who have experienced similar things and who feel alone. And yeah. I feel like the purpose of memoir, like all literature, is to make people feel less alone and more like they would be understood and that and sure. that they're part of a shared humanity. Yeah. Now how long after your your marriage ended did you start writing? So um I left my first marriage in 
early 2015. Um, I wasn't writing anything that later became the book, um, like in new writing until I already had been diagnosed with cancer and had my mastectomy um, and was in the middle of my divorce. So that was at, at least a, you know, that was about a year later um, that I probably started writing. It was at least a year later. Um, mm -hmm. But some parts of the book, like the parts about caregiving my parents who lived downstairs for me, my father for 16 years, my mother for 20 years um, before their deaths. Um, some of those bits um, were culled and reshaped from old essays that I had mm. written about caregiving my parents in which I had basically more or less written myself out of the narrative because I was kind of leading a secret life even from myself at the time of the writing. Like in the beginning of writing those essays, I was just a lot on, more unhappy than I was yeah. willing to talk about on paper. And by the end of the you know the series of essays I published from my parents I was already having an affair and so obviously I was literally leading a double life and I was ashamed of myself so so I was kind of the peripheral narrator of my own life and I later turned to some of those old essays which were dating back in some cases to 2006 like years before the okay. the affair began but um but just kind of like gutting them and excavating them and pulling the, the things that were relevant out to the surface, but being like, now where do I go in here? And yeah. leaving that all in. And I was wondering, just because I know you're a writer, so sometimes when you're actually having an experience, do you ever have the thought, oh, I can write about this? Are you, or is it? It's 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 our little kernel of comfort in like the darkest hours. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, in many cases, it's kind of like a wry self joke, you know, like, well, maybe I'll, you know, there, there's a Sean Colvin line where she's like, I hate that shit when they say, oh, you know, you got a song out of it. But like, you know, there is always that that little bit in your head where you're like, oh, God, the world is burning. Maybe someday this will be an essay. You know, and my my dear friend Megan Steelstra is an absolute genius at like whenever you're telling her about a five alarm dumpster fire, like she'll find the line and like, you know, and write you back like the line you just text her, texted her and say like, this is an essay. You know? so. <laughs> uh, so um, I wonder if you would mind reading a little bit for us. Sure, sure. I actually will read just straight from the beginning because um, I'm not going to read very long. Um, okay. The opening chapter is called The Story of A. And it's, I'll, I'll just say up front that it's, a, I started it in a kind of unconventional way for a memoir because I sort of wanted to announce to the reader straight away, like, hey, this is going to be a weird book. Like, it's going to be a lot of stuff in here that is not just like, one day I woke up and this happened to me. But so, yeah. so, um, the story of A, and it begins with a quote, the lie which elates us is dearer than a thousand sober truths. And that's Anton Chekhov misquoting Pushkin. A is for adulteress, but you knew that. There's no virtually no history of literature without the adulteress. Anna Karenina, Emma Bovary, Hester Prynne, Daisy Buchanan, Molly Bloom. The adulteress throws herself in front of a train, runs over her husband's lover with a car, walks into the ocean intent on dying without a care for her children. A is for adulteress, agent of ruin, woman. A is for accused. Researchers at Cardiff Metropolitan University revealed that when there has been infidelity in a marriage, most wives tend to blame the other woman, whereas most husbands see their cheating wife as the guilty party. Basically, whoever dropped dead in the broom closet, the adulteress did it. A is for author. Allow me to reveal the A on my breast. For the sake of this narrative, my name might as well be A. Once a woman becomes an adulteress, her other identities, mother, daughter, friend, editor, writer, teacher, become largely invisible to others, as irrelevant as the clothing she horishly, treasonously shed. A is for asshole. There is no slur for men to match the equivalent of mistress or even other woman. Philanderer doesn't have the same punch and is sex nonspecific. Cuckold denotes a man who is being cheated on. A player or even a dog could be single or married. An asshole could be the guy who took your parking spot at Trader Joe's as well as the man who fucked your wife. There are no names specifically for men who break their promises to women. A is for age. 
For the first time in documented human history, among adults ages 18 to 29 who have ever been married, a general social survey reports that women are marginally more likely than men to be unfaithful. The survey also found that infidelity rates increase in middle age for both men and women, and that contrary to both social and literary stereotypes, women reach their highest levels of infidelity in their 60s. A is for adultery. In the United States, adultery remains illegal across 17 states. In Illinois, where A first kissed her lover, the wrong spouse could even sue the cheater's lover for alienation of affection. In Massachusetts, where A and her lover reinstated their affair 2.0 after having been broken up for nearly nine months, adultery is a felony, theoretically punishable by up to life in prison. And um, I'll... I'll stop there, but it just goes on with a, a series of, of A's um, until essentially there's finally one that says A is for arithmetic. No matter how ashamed of herself a narrator may be, the mathematics of accountability nonetheless dictate that A plus A plus A plus A can never equal I. And at that point, I shift first person. Mm -hmm. in the book, so. mm -hmm. No, it's great. Great. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's infuriating as well. <laughs> it's just, you know, I've, I mean, and the thing that you said about, you know, when, um, when, when Trump was elected and you said the patriarchy had won and it is white women that it helped help that happen and, you know, set us back years after all that hard earned progress. And it is, it is it's infuriating. It's infuriating. It is, um, it is infuriating I was gonna, and terrifying and all the things. Yeah, I mean that's why I'm so glad you 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 know you've written this, and I want more women to write stuff like this because I think it's very necessary. Um, but I was going to ask you because I know you said in there that you were you were doing therapy for people when you were fairly young. You were about twenty three, but I imagine very you were young, very, yes. I imagine I you were very good at it. Um, you know, sorry. I um I think I was fairly good at it for my age you know I mean I was incredibly young um and I had clients who were um teenagers who had been taken out of their home um of origin and put into foster care for very severe histories of physical and sexual abuse um so I worked with a foster care agency but my first job was what was then called a battered women's agency of course we don't say that you know use that phrase anymore mm -hmm. but um I ran groups and did individual therapy and I also as part of that job did things like take women to get their restraining orders at court you know um so I was really kind of a troubleshooter um just in training and the following year I helped to open a women's wellness center in a prison town in Vermont um wow. And so I was doing a lot of things at that time I was doing a pilot program about eating disorders driving around to um various high schools and doing presentations about that and groups about that and dating violence and you know a lot of different specialties but I will say like I um I suffered quite a bit of burnout after several intensive years of doing that kind of work because no, I no think wonder. you know what had gotten me into the work was the level of violence directed at girls and women in my old neighborhood um and I think there were a lot of things I had not yet worked through in my own life when I was doing the work. So mm -hmm. although I do hope I was good at it, I needed a break. I went back and got my master's in um, in creative writing and I just fell in love with the literary world and editing mm -hmm. and uh, became an editor at a magazine and later yeah. launched the press. And I didn't ever go back to being a therapist, but um, I miss it sometimes. I mean, I really yeah. did work well because your insights are amazing I mean you really dig into stuff and really you keep questioning why why let's go deeper come on let's just keep going another layer another layer which is brilliant um yeah uh and I was kind of horrified at the amount of violence that you did witness even as a child I'm like well, these gang rapes I'm like good god so I mean that's I don't mean to laugh I mean but it's like right now you know this whole scandal about Alice Monroe and her and her daughter has just mm -hmm. broken and you know and I and in no way is any of it funny but it's yeah. sort of like every woman at the same point is kind of like why are we shocked or we're not shocked because of course this is 
Literally, I mean, you know, Monroe's refusal to accept what had happened to her daughter as meaningful in her own life or anything she needed to do anything about um, was exactly the same as the reason that literally every foster girl I worked with had been taken out of her home. Um, in every case, the mother chose the abuser over her children. Now, I mean, at least Monroe, at least, you know, her daughter was an adult by the time she came to her with this information so I guess she couldn't have stopped it in the moment as she didn't know about it although her ex-husband the girl's father did um but it's just all so devastatingly common and and I have been coming up the last few days I've been talking a lot with friends about it I've said a few things on social media about it I still come up against this old assumption, like the me that grew up in poverty, that grew up in in kind of a neighborhood that was full of gangs and where there were no social workers in the schools and nobody mm. knew what we were doing and et cetera. Um, I still really come up against like, but wait, how could that happen to someone of the stature of Alice Monroe at all this, you know, comparative privilege and, and, and ex, you know, acceptability and support systems and it's like my father used to say you know honey like you're kidding yourself there's no place any different from here and while he was not right on the surface sometimes there's a scene in my book where my father and I have a conversation where he recognizes that I was looking for a kind of life that he didn't know existed and he died shortly after that and so basically I was just thinking about this last night. Like we both died thinking that I had had the final punchline of that. Like, yes, dad, there was this world that you didn't know existed. Oh, and I found it. But really I was the chump. My father was right. You mm -hmm. know, it's, the niceties change depending on your social class, you know, your, your, place in the world and what's acceptable on the surface of that government your race your gender identity all of these things but there's a certain truth that there is just a constant you know oppression of and exploitation of women mm -hmm. everywhere that women are ourselves also so often complicit in and it is yeah full and horrible and yeah. father was not as wrong as i believed him to be and you know i never made the correlation before between um like you said keeping secrets and and carrying shame and not being able to verbalize stuff and then getting illnesses and diseases and of course i mean right i mean, right. I mean so we don't know right i mean of course like Women are so understudied that we don't know why women get certain diseases more than men get them um, because there aren't as many research studies on women. Right. But it's certainly also not unreasonable. For example, women have so many more autoimmune conditions than men do, right? And autoimmune conditions used to just be regarded as fake, but now we know that they're real. We see the markers for them. We can test for them. We have all mm -hmm. kinds of, you know, proven treatments for them, et cetera. But we still don't really know exactly why women get them so much more frequently than men do. Well, I mean, we're just starting to look at epigenetics and intergenerational trauma and things like that. And so while we know that that is particularly strong in certain families, um, it it's arguable that all women are carrying so many yeah. centuries of epigenetic yeah. trauma that our bodies would not necessarily function exactly the same as men's. Yeah. No, I mean, it's staggering. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's one of my subjects that really triggers me. And um, I, I, you know, I think about like that you can actually still stone a woman to death for cheating and whatever in some countries. And like, if there was men being stoned to death, I think it would be a whole different story, but it's just a woman, oh. so we don't really care. It's like, God, it, it's sort of like the the <laughs> line, you know, like if men got their period, it would be a sacrament, you know. Yes, I mean, exactly. it's like it's just, I mean, it is really the double standards of things oh. are so absurd. You know what we see happening in the yeah. United States yeah. right now with with you know our reproductive rights being 
challenged and 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 you know dismantled to the point not only um where abortion is the target but really where pregnancy is being criminalized women's bodies are being criminalized like so now if you were to do something and you ended up having a miscarriage oh you know she did a bad thing and it caused her miscarriage. We know one in every four pregnancies ends in miscarriage, right? So let me I ask you, um, I know because you have just, you're about to release another book or you just have released another just, book, right? Oh, yesterday, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so congratulations on that. Thank you, and, and do thank you, wanna, you. Do you want to talk a bit about that one? Sure, I would love to. Um, it's it was such a wild, amazing thing for me to to do because it's um it's just a completely different kind of book. I mean, it's um it's about Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan quartet, um her Neapolitan novels, which basically um many listeners may know as the My Brilliant Friend novels because there's an HBO uh, series called My Brilliant Friend. And Elena Ferrante has become something of a since, you know, international sensation. A lot of her books have now been made into series and, and film and so forth. Um, but I wrote about those four novels mainly because although they center on um, a, a couple of girlhood friends who grew up in Naples and were born in the 1940s, mm -hmm. The parallels to my own neighborhood growing up are uncanny and insane. I've never read a series of novels that was, I, I've never written a series of novels that was as autobiographical about my own life as this series yeah. of novels. It's weird. And then there's the controversy about like, who is Elena Ferrante, where um, many scholars have sort of, um, it seems pretty much, proven that um a, a very famous male italian novelist is at least at minimum involved um in the creation of the elena ferrante novels so so that's been a bit of a scandal that hasn't gotten anywhere near as much press in the united states as it has done in europe i think because people don't want to know and i didn't want to know um and then and so part of the book is is just like a deep deep dive into these four books that really form one novel um my own my own reflections about my own life and relationship to them it's part of a series called bookmarked where many writers have have you know taken books that are really personal to them and have sort of hybrided memoir and and you know book criticism but then at the end of mine i also have kind of like a a you know a look into what is this controversy should we care about it and why or why not and mm -hmm. so that was really fun. Oh, fantastic. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on today and chatting with me. It's been and, such a pleasure. It's really and, lovely to meet you. And I wish you all the best with this with this new release. And, with, you know, it, it really helped me to know as I was reading your book that Rob was the, was the guy and that you were going to be with him because I know you're with him. And that really helped because I'm like, oh, good, oh, good, oh, good, oh, good. <laughs> yes, indeed. We've uh, we've been married now for over four years and, uh, oh. and we're about to move to the California desert together after yeah. uh, our youngest goes to college. Yeah. No, I'm very happy for you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's thank really you. Yeah. You, all my friends have spoken so well of you, and um, and yeah, I, yeah. I look. Thank to, you. If you need anything else, just let me know. Okay, all right, I will do. Thank you again. Bye. All right, bye.